Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, coming to us live from Seattle, reporting from Agile Open Northwest, Woody Zool. Woody, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're great. Also joining us, Amitai Schleier, Mr. Schleier, from reporting to us from a location unknown uh, with a hotel of suspect Wi-Fi quality. Amitai, how are you doing? That's right. I'm coming to you from Columbus, Ohio, which I think some people know. I don't know it that well, but I'm deciding to bypass the hotel Wi-Fi because it seems kind of chunky, and I'm using my phone and high technology. Doing well. So, of course, uh, I love our friends over there in, uh, in Columbus, uh, the creators, curators, organizers of the Path to Agility Conference. So, a lot of friends of the show and a lot of friends of ours personally over in Columbus. So, it's a great location to visit. So, guys, tonight, uh, before we get too deep into a specific Agile topic, Woody, you have, you have, you have the opportunity to be up in Seattle right now at the uh, Agile Open Northwest Conference. How's it going up there? What? Yeah, it's one of my... The Agile Open Northwest is one of my favorite conferences. It's very personal because uh, uh, it's an open space style conference. And uh, if people don't know what that is, you can visit their website. They have a real nice description and definition of it. But it's ba- basically an attendee created conference. And uh, it's just, I mean, the Northwest is just full of great agilists. So it's wonderful to, to have a chance to connect up with these folks and and spend time with them. It's been great so far. So what kind of uh, sessions have you participated in, or hopefully you've led a few already? You know, what kind of topics are are flying around this year? Yeah, there was actually a a huge um, selection of things to do. I think there's over 250 people at this, so it's it's the biggest open space I've been to, and there were a lot of proposed talks and things going on everywhere. One that I went to uh, that I really enjoyed was with... uh, Rebecca Wearsbrock on uh, Checklist Manifesto is based on the book uh, Checklist Manifesto, which uh, it, it's a pretty interesting book. Uh, I had a boss buy it for me a few years ago because he had, he had read it and thought that it was something great for us. So I, I actually uh, kind of adopted some of the ideas in there. But the basic thing is you free up some of your uh, mental space by having checklists for the, uh, the things that you need to just keep track of. And it was great. It was a great uh, little session. I think what I heard about that one is my, my initial reaction, and I think a lot of people's was be careful because uh, we tend to see in our workplaces the over application of checklists or things that people assume can be reduced to checklists. Well, but that, that doesn't mean that no things can. And checklists can still be useful when there are some standard things to at least make sure you thought about when you're applying your judgment that you don't want to forget to have thought about. Is that what it is about? Yeah, I think I can give a simple example of a checklist. Red, green, refactor. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, you know, the, the tantra, and that's sort of the idea. If you just follow it, and you're sort of checking it off as you go. Now, that's just one example, and it's a very simple one. But I think we can think of a lot of things as checklists. The idea of being taking the cognitive load off you so you're not forgetting things that you kind of have to re- routinely you know, handle. But it was still, it was a good workshop because... For a good uh, session, because this is exactly what the conversation was like. We were talking about where does that work, where does it not work, how have we used this idea, what problems have we seen. So, it's in that stuff in a face-to-face, uh, you know, setting. I love it. Yeah, it, it's a fun topic. I found that uh, once I got past the age of thirty, a, a checklist became mandatory 
as many of my thoughts and things I needed to do were flying out of my head, much to the dismay of, dismay of my wife and you know the things I was forgetting. But at the same time, I found that if I let the checklist get too big, uh, suddenly there's almost a feeling of despair or of um, not being able to, to get through all of it and then that affecting <laughs> moods. So there, there's definitely some pros and cons, but I found that uh, checklists and just lists of... Uh, of activities has has gotten me through a few tight spots here. Ryan, you used to be so smart. What happened? Yeah, I got older. <laughs> <laughs> I got older, and we had kids, and that uh, uh, decimated my brain. Right. So it. Uh, well, so so let me share what how I think the thing here with the checklist is not about you know having a shopping list where you've written down the things that necessarily that you want to go do. These are the things that you might have that are recurring. Um, sure. So, and, and there's some points of it. If you have an important checklist, like in a in a health model, maybe you're you're getting ready to prepare somebody for surgery or something. And I think the the book covers some of these things. Then you might have a checklist where two people are using the checklist. The one will will read them off, uh, and the other will say check. So that you're you're actually doing these are you know, sort of repetitive things, not um, uh, not something you just put together at the moment. So that you don't forget the things that are important and to do in the order they're meant to be done in and that's sort of an idea. So it's just sort of to make it easier to do some of these things that we get bored with maybe otherwise. And you still get to use your judgment about whether to do them, but you maybe choose not to do them instead of forgetting not to do them. Yeah, and especially if you're doing them as a team or as a pair, then you can you can actually confirm with each other that your decisions are good decisions. Yeah. Well, and it's also a great way to to almost have a, a working contract with another person. This, these are the things we're going to do. These are the things we're committed to doing. And so that we're not focused on on that aspect of the work, we're going to have it in this list that we can refer to, and our, our mental power can actually be focused on the, the true task at hand. Yeah. So, I have a great example of that. Uh, for example, onboarding a uh, new hire was brought up uh, in the workshop today. And uh, back at, uh, you know, where I used to work there, we had uh, a checklist to make sure that somebody new coming on, that we would order the, uh, you know, their password or their their user ID, I mean, and uh, maybe the machine they're going to need and have it all set up ready for them when they get there. Here's the six things that we're going to take care of for a new hire so the day they arrive, things go smoothly, that sort of thing. Well, it sounds like a great session. I'll I'll get a, a link to... Uh, Agile Open Northwest, so that the listeners can check out that conference and and hopefully attend it next year if they feel so inclined. I'll also get a link to the book. It sounds like a uh, fascinating read, so I have a feeling uh, a new book's about to find its way to my Kindle. Yeah, uh, very... I, I would suggest for for this particular book, it's a quick read and it's a very clear concept, so that's a good thing. And I would add another one if you want to just have a list of books to put at the end. I think it's called Simple Rules. Uh, that's kind of closely related to this. So uh, neither of these would I consider like you must have books. They're just good, good solid books to, to have the ideas uh, in front of you. Very good. So, Woody, there's another uh, event that's going on, uh, I believe, this year that uh, I think Amitai and I would love to hear about. There's a, a mob programming conference coming up that I think you're involved in organizing. I'm wondering if you can share any information at this point. I know it's um, still coming together, still being organized, but I know there's a lot of listeners out there that love this uh, this topic, love this concept, and anything you can share about that would uh, would really be appreciated. Sure, sure. Well, I really appreciate the chance to talk about that. Uh, we have this concept, uh, Llewellyn and... Uh, Llewellyn Falco and I and uh, Nancy Van Schoenderwert, who works out of the Boston area. And uh, we've all attended uh, the, the Agile New England Games, uh, Agile Games Conference uh, over the last number of years, and Nancy works closely with them over there. And so we thought if we could do a conference in Boston, it's actually in Cambridge, that would be connected with the Agile Games Conference. It's really a closely related sort of a topic. That might be a good thing. And so this is doing, being hosted by the Agile New England group, user group there. I've actually visited their group. It's one of the most amazing uh, Agile groups I've uh, had the pleasure of being with. They have many, many members showing up to the meetings. Uh, I think there was over 100 at the meeting I went to. And I was quite impressed. So anyways, there you go. The, the dates of it are set. We've been uh, – the registration is open. We've got uh, – 
I don't know, more than 10 people, I think, already uh, enrolled or uh, registered. And the dates, is, uh, the dates are Sunday and Monday, May 1st and 2nd. Because the Agile Games Conference, I believe, is the last three days of, of April. So May 1st and 2nd. I hope I said that right. May 1st and 2nd. So that's coming up pretty soon. And I'd love to see people there. Uh, there we, we have kind of an interesting concept. This will be a hands-on event. Uh, almost everything will be two days of mob programming. We'll do some sort of an introduction uh, on the first day at the beginning, and then we'll break off into teams that will be doing mob programming all day long on various things, either code katas or uh, perhaps simple problems that are not katas or whatever. And we will meet occasionally for retrospectives and maybe a kind of a little open space uh, sessions about what we've learned. Uh, we've got about five or six mentors coming from all around the world who are experienced mob programmers, and they will be bringing their expertise to help facilitate the teams and see where we can go with just sharing the goodness of us. Well, that certainly sounds like a great event, Woody, and thanks for sharing that with us. We'll uh, we'll get links to that in the show notes. So if sounds like this would be uh, the event to attend if you've ever wanted to learn how to do mob programming or just be a part of of a, of a training around that. It sounds like you're bringing in the top people, clearly uh, you being one of them, uh, into this group, and they're going to have access to uh, some of the brightest uh, in this space. So really exciting stuff there. Really neat concept, Woody. Well, thanks. I think uh, the, the nice thing about this is, in conjunction with the Agile Games, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting people throughout that but at five days of these two things. So I can't hardly imagine it not being a wonderful time. I'm just wondering, do you have any idea how many people are expected or how the well, logistics I, of splitting them up will go? Yeah, we're limited to uh, the amount of people that the, uh, the venue can hold, which I think is about 125. It's going to be at the uh, Microsoft Nerd Center at MIT in Cambridge. So that's going to be the upper limit. Um, I'd love to see 80 or 100 people. Of course, I'd love to fill the thing, but but my my aspect, but my idea right now is that if we get a good turnout, we're going to see five or six different teams and maybe up to 10 different teams working in separate on separate things. Everything from beginner sessions to maybe what you can si- consider uh, experience sessions and then advanced sessions. So maybe some people are already coaching this at some places. You know, for example, one of the mentors that's coming is um, is Alex Wilson, who works at Unruly in uh, London, mm-hmm. and they've been doing mob programming for a couple of years now, and actually spoke about it at the uh, XP 2015 in uh, Helsinki, and so he uh, he's got you know they've got a lot of ex- advanced experience. I want to share about another person who's coming in, and that's uh, Leonard Frieden from Stockholm. Uh, about I'm not sure how long ago, but I think about six months ago, he embarked on a sort of a journeyman tour where he went from company to company in the area where he uh, works and just spent a week or two in each company spreading a lot of good things besides just mob programming, but sharing mob programming everywhere he went. He would actually just go in, uh, spend a few weeks at a company, and work with them uh, on anything they wanted to work on, uh, sort of a... uh, a journeyman tour similar to how you might have heard uh, there's a few other folks in the software realm that have done that. So I thought that was pretty cool. And there's a couple others, a couple of folks from Hunter, uh, Dexter Balga and uh, and uh, Aaron Griffith. Uh, Dexter was one of the original mob programmers at Hunter Industries where we sort of originated the idea. And uh, Aaron was one of our, I think he was the first hire after we started mobbing. So he has a good perspective of what is it like to join a team that's already mobbing and, and agreeing to come into that environment. And I'm hoping to get another person from Hunter, someone who was involved from the start, uh, but from a different department who worked with us on various things, but wasn't actually part of the team in a traditional sense. So if that works out, uh, you know, that's going to be pretty cool. So Woody, for the listeners who may not be familiar with uh, mob programming, could you give just a quick uh, description of what it is, how it works, and, and perhaps some of the philosophies behind it. Oh, that's a that's a good point because it's not really wide know, widely known. 
although more and more people and more and more companies are doing this, the basic idea is pair programming expanded to an entire team. So that means that everybody's going to work on the same thing at the same time in the same space and at the same computer. So that's sort of uh, teamwork brought to software development. Beyond just the developers, you'll have testers, uh, the product experts, uh, database experts, whatever, whoever's needed for the basic uh, you know, uh, knowledge that's needed for whatever we're working on at that time is working together on it. And it seems like it could be kind of a crazy idea. It seems like maybe it, uh, it wouldn't be productive or it may not be engaging to people. I'm not sure. You know, there's lots of things people have brought up as to how could that possibly work. But somehow it did work for us. And we noticed it. Uh, we kind of discovered it by accident. We were uh, had gathered to look at some work that we were going to work on as a, a, like in a traditional meeting. And since we had already been doing study together, we started interacting with each other as if we were studying. Somebody pointed out a, a, you know, like a long method and say, well, let's fix that. And as we started fixing the things, we started uh, noticing we were getting a lot done and we just kept doing it. That was four years ago, uh, four and a half years ago. Oh, I, I, there's something else I want to share about that. And that is that while at first we thought this was just for important things, it turned out it made us a very effective team at even working on the mundane things because we would start noticing stuff that we could just automate. And instead of having uh, you know, us just doing mediocre or uh, mundane is a better word, you know, by rote stuff, uh, we would just turn into something we don't need to do anymore at all, click of a button sort of thing. So it's just something that just keeps expanding for us. That's something I've seen too, that uh, when a team has you know, small impediments or uh, impediments that are unlikely to, to warrant other people helping remove them. And then you take that team and make it work as a mob so that everybody is blocked by the dumb thing that seemed small before. All of a sudden, yes. it's not as small, and you do something about it. Yeah, that's a good point. Because we kind of feel like we don't want to, I'll put it in quotes, you know, we don't want to waste everybody's time. And so we, when we put, all put our mind on it, we can go, well, we don't even need to do this anymore if we can figure this out. And that often happens. Well, an interesting uh, experiment that we ran recently is it uh, onboarded a new uh, developer to the team. Uh, a project was already in flight. So there was an existing code base, uh, but it is Greenfield development. So it is a new product or a new tool uh, that's under development. And to bring this person up to speed, we actually ran a mob programming experiment. Uh, Could this be faster to educate someone about a code base rather than they just flounder for a few weeks and, and somewhat get it? And what we found was uh, this actually allowed this new hire to almost be immediately effective. Uh, it was it was really an interesting uh, insight that we found. Instead of, you know, the normal you know, two month ramp up to be effective on a code base that, that we had seen in the past. Uh, day one, sitting down at a keyboard with uh, the three other developers who were working uh, on that code that day. And, uh, you know, really by the end of that day, you know, he's writing different tests and he's trying things out. And all of a sudden, you know, we have a new hire who, who's almost immediately effective. Yes. And I thought, this was just fascinating. The, the onboarding w was excellent, but it's the learning being amplified. Yes. That, uh, that really caught my attention. It's going to be some, there's going to be some blog posts coming out soon on this, but um, the amplified learning is such a, a wonderful side effect of, of this that, you know, I almost think you could take junior programmers or what a, what a horrible term, right? Let's say just new people new to the profession, pair them or even uh, put them in a mob with more experienced people. And I think the learning curve uh, significantly decreases. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I've seen the same thing. If, if somebody joins the, and they're going to be uh, permanently on the team, then they're effective almost immediately because they're contributing at the level they're able to contribute mm -hmm. without knowing the domain of the application at all. They're, they're able to contribute because there's others there with the knowledge they need for that part of it. Uh, I've had it before for myself. I remember one job where I went through about two months of training before I was able to start working on actual code about their 
their you know essentially domain model about their code model the the objects that were you know available the libraries that were available but by the time I got done with that two months of training and actually start working I still had tons of questions every time I started in on something it, it wasn't very effective so it's still someone has to work with you to answer those questions this is almost automatic you bring your skills to it immediately you start uh, gaining the knowledge and the knowledge spreading very quickly across the team and whatever we're doing. I think that's all a, a big advantage of working this way. Yeah, if we were to treat uh, what many teams do where people work solo or in pairs as a thought experiment, like so let's say mob programming is what everybody did, and instead we were thinking about, well, what if we worked in pairs or solo? Well, in order for that to work effectively, everybody on the team or every you know pair on the team would have to know 85 to 95 percent of everything about what's going on in order to, to be able to go off and work effectively by themselves and conversely when you bring someone out of the team you know that they don't have that background so what I've seen with mobbing and what makes sense even in the abstract is that because when people start there's so many things they don't know about how to contribute uh, you could spend a lot of time, two months, I've seen six at some environments, before people feel like they know enough to safely operate themselves and, and take a story and finish it. Or yes. you could put them in a group and work together, and whatever basic things they do see and they do understand, they can be part of the conversation and they can, they can apply their critical thinking skills and, and do their thinking out loud and contribute to the solving of the problem with whatever they're able to understand so far. Yeah, I could share a... An interesting first eye-opener for me on this was we had gotten, so in the early days of mob programming at Hunter, we, uh, once people start finding out about it, they would send me a, a tweet or an email saying, hey, I'm going to be in your area. Can I come out by and visit? And we got one such uh, query from a, a fellow up in uh, Winnipeg, up in uh, Manitoba, I guess. Uh, I have to learn my Canadian geography. It sounds right to me. But um, so he had sent me a note. I didn't really know him. I may have conversed with him a little bit in, in the on the internet. And uh, I said, "Sure, please come by." And we people would come and see what we were doing, and we would always invite them to join the the mob and actually program. We put them in the rotation, the way we said, so they're on the list of people who are going to take the keyboard. So he showed up. I had no idea what his skill set was, whether he was even a programmer. He shows up. He sits down with us, and within 10 minutes, he was guiding us through some difficult code stuff. He was an expert coder <laughs> nice. at the language we were using, and almost immediately, he, he improved the quality of the work we were doing. Well, that, that was like a, an eye-opener eye opener for me, and I realized that this gives a person who has the skills that are needed at the moment to contribute. They can just sit there and learn until they feel they have a chance to contribute. It's kind of a, it's a weird thing that way, but it's almost instant. So if we had decided, you know, he was a candidate, we decided to hire him, he, he would be an important part of the team starting that first day. So that's a pretty powerful thing. And that story highlights yet another area that this can be effective. I mean, the interview process. You know, right now it's let's run through your resume, ask a few questions about, about your background, hope that every skill you listed is somewhat accurate, that you haven't embellished, or the interview process is spend two hours in the mob and, and take on take your spot in the rotation and let's see how you do. And either you, you contribute or you don't, it works for you or it doesn't. And we can actually see right there um, how this could work in the future. Yeah, being introduced to this idea before you actually come work there uh, is a good thing too because there's nothing normal or typical uh, about <laughs> the way we're working when it comes to software development. There's not many people working as a team. I've met a few since who have said, well, yeah, we, we've used to do this or we've done this a few times, but it, it was pretty rare. Now it's not rare. I, I run into people daily. I was just in Boston and uh, went to a company there that had five or six teams that were mobbing. So it's pretty amazing. But still, the idea that let's get a view of what that really looks like before I hire into it, that's probably a good thing too. So it works good in both directions. Def and this isn't for everybody. Mob programming is not the kind of thing that – that every person would feel comfortable with. Whatever you do is exposed to everybody else all the time. So if you're, if you're not good at the keyboard or you're not good at the language that you're working in, people will see your mistakes. 
And the other side of it is when you're navigating, which I think navigating is a lot harder. Mm-hmm. But when you're when you're trying to explain yourself, uh, your idea to the rest of the team, you know that's going to show a lot about you. So there's nothing about this that's um, comfortable for some people. For others, it's just like natural; they just fit right in. So. It's and there are some who didn't think that it was going to be for them, but find that it's a really nice way of working, and then it changes them a little bit. Well, that's a really good point, and I've seen a lot of that, too. Yeah, for me, I, personally, I really like coding. I, I, I don't mind it if I don't have a pair or, or a mob to work with, but if I'm doing meaningful, productive code, I want to at least be working with a pair. Once mm-hmm. I get good at working with a pair, it saved so much trouble for me than when I worked alone. Uh, you know, it's, I, I catch mm, a lot fewer of the mistakes I'm making and the problems I'm building for myself when I'm working with a pair. So, yeah, I really prefer it. But yeah. It's the stuff that makes you slow that when you're working alone, you don't notice the slow that you're adding. And when you have a pair, you notice more of it. And when you have a mob, you notice just about all of it. Yeah, and this, this is an interesting point because... Uh, how fast we're working isn't as critical as how better we stay focused on doing good things. So rather than, oh, we're not, you know, we're not busy enough in our work, it's let's make this better. Someone will always say something effective. You know what? That test isn't very good. Or that name, we could do a better job with that name. So as soon as a method grows to 20 or 30 lines, someone says, I can see how we could compose that. So we have all our our minds are on it, and we're if we were working alone, rushing through our work, we'd say well, that later. We we don't have much of the I'll take care of that later approach because we know if we don't do it now, it's just going to slow us down later. So let's take care of it now. I think mobs so, also notice uh, to to add on to that, they notice if we're spending a day or two. And it turns out this thing we were trying to do is maybe going to lead us down a rabbit hole or maybe we're already starting to go down a rabbit hole. Then it's a lot harder for an entire group of people to do that than it is for one. And so a mob is more self-correcting when it turns out that maybe that's not the best way to solve a problem. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, I've observed that as well. The idea that as soon as somebody on the team goes, you know what, I think we've got to find a better path, then everybody else sort of respects that. And instead of just sticking with this thing that's, um, you know, that's that's going to go down that rabbit hole, we all kind of reflect, take a step back. That's a good point. So this is taking what for some is a very solitary activity, the act of programming, of writing, editing, testing code, and turning it into uh, a major social activity within a company. So I'm wondering if you've seen... Uh, in certain organizations or in certain environments, if that that new social structure has caused conflict, and if there's been some resistance to it, if there's been um, some disagreements, because then the reason I ask is it seems like it would take a very fostering kind of culture, a nurturing culture, an open, honest, safe, respectful culture for this to work correctly. And perhaps um, at the beginning, maybe that's not where things were. Do you have any experiences in those areas, or, or has it been a pretty smooth transition for the teams that you guys have worked with? So the, my initial experience was uh, very positive, but we did have, after a couple of weeks, uh, it became clear that you know working with other people all day long, every day, and it's the same people, can you know the, the little things that wouldn't bother you if you if you weren't working with them all day long, can start bothering you. So it's sort of the idea that familiarity breeds contempt, perhaps. So you start resenting some things and so on. So we set out our own little, you might think, a mini core protocol. Uh, and we did it through a, a retrospective where we all wrote on a separate post it notes a few words that would describe how we would like to treat each other if we were to be able to get along well. So... After we gathered those up, a team of five people, we maybe had 15 words that we gathered, and then we uh, affinity grouped them, you know, gathered together the ones that were similar, that we would treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect. And my, my memory, and I might be wrong with this, but my memory is we kind of said, we're going to pretend to treat each other with kindness, consideration, and respect until we learn what that feels like and see if we can do it. 
And that actually worked out really good, at least for me, and I think for the whole team. It's, it's still not easy or perfect, but that's a good thing. But I have worked with some teams since then that do have some problems in getting along well. And my advice always is, let's not overdo it. Let's just find a way to take advantage of this when we can, the working together. And when we need to be separate, let's be separate. There's, there's no rule that you have to just sit and put up with uh, a, a situation all day long. Let's work on making it better. Let's reflect on it. Uh, we can set boundaries and feel like this is inappropriate behavior. Uh, this is okay. Yeah, I, I've seen plenty of... Uh, my advice almost always is let's not make it mandatory. Let's make this um, totally voluntary. And if you feel like doing it, do it. Yeah, I think the, the great strength when it's working well of mob programming is how it draws attention to problems. It magnifies problems. So if you are a team... Uh, in an organization that can act on and resolve those problems, then it's an amazingly useful tool. If you if you work together and you're supported in it, then you want to draw attention to problems because you tend to fix them. But if you're a team that doesn't work together when you have that situation or you're in an organization that can't help you or gets in your way, or you didn't choose the team or who gets to be on the team, or maybe you even didn't choose that you're going to be mob programming, all of those things, Yeah, uh, I think mob programming magnifies those problems too. And so it makes a lot of sense when you're in those situations to ramp it back. Yeah, there's no, there's no reason that we have to experience uh, this in its fullness all the time. And, and I think that it's, it's well worth learning how to do it so you know what, what are the prerequisites. Because I think if you just had a checklist like we were talking earlier, it said, well, you have to take care of all these things, and then you can mob program. I think it's kind of the opposite. Try a little bit. See what you need to work through. That may be all you need to do, a couple little things. I got with a team not too long ago that seemed to gel instantly, and and they just are keeping at it, you know, steadily. So, you know, every, every organization is different. I'm looking forward to some that I'm going to meet with in a few weeks that, uh, that they're just getting the idea uh, that maybe working together is good. Just to, so I can experience that again, you know, to see the, the beginning forming of, of this as a, as a practice. That's not the right word, not practice, as, a, as an approach, you know, because I think what it all comes down to is if we can't learn to work well, then we're going to have troubles no matter what model of work we're doing. There, there's mm -hmm. no way to just be solo. Uh, we have to interact somehow. I tend to look at my kids and how they interact with other kids because I, I find a lot of purity in what they're doing and how it relates back to what Agile is supposed to be, at least one interpretation of it. And what I find is that they mob everything. You know, these, these kids all want to be in groups together doing uh, things together. They figure out the conflict pretty quick. And when they can't, you know, sometimes, you know, that you got the kid that, that won't stop biting other kids or things like that, and you have to step in. But, but for the most part, they find their way through it uh, they figure out how, what game they're going to play, how they're going to play it, how to be successful at it. You know, every once in a while, a kid will take their ball and go home. But for the most part, they're figuring these things out almost as well, and in many cases, even better than adults. And so I find it is kind of fascinating to watch them, you know, play those situations out because many times um, it, it's just like, it's just like how it plays out at work. Only perhaps they might do it a little more maturely than us sometimes. Yeah, I think you're bringing up a very uh, clear uh, scenario because I've watched this with kids and I can remember in my own childhood. You'd go out on the street and the kids are playing a game you don't yet know. And right. uh, nobody takes you aside and say, okay, well, here's the rules. And they go through the book of all the ways you need to, you know, what does it mean to be out of bounds and so on. And so, how do you get out? you know, or how do you get it, or whatever it might be. You don't know. You know, you just watch the game for a little while, and somebody, pre pretty soon somebody brings you into the game, and you learn the rules as you do it, uh, and it's, they're really good at, that's the thing. I think kids are really good at picking up that situation. That's, I think they believe that children, during a certain period, they can learn new languages really quickly, and so they're in that phase, learning about how, all, they're really observant about that. And you're right. Well, and, you just do it. And, and I think part of it too is is they do not have 
that thing that at some point in adulthood most of us cre- you know create and that's that aversion to looking like a fool you know they they don't have the the i don't want to look stupid in front of everybody kind of tendency and so they're willing to just show up and try something and i i find that um whether it's um humility or perhaps that's not the right word but they have that trait where they're not worried about how this looks you know the They'll dance at the end of the movie and and not care who's watching or or they'll do all of these things just because it's it's a, a a neat thing to do or they just want to be involved in a group, but at some point we get these these blocks in our heads that we can't we can't look like the fool we can't admit a weakness we can't show we don't know something and perhaps that's what um, keeps us from having that that childlike ability to adapt to to learn quickly and to amplify learning as a group. I'm a kid. Nobody expects yeah. me to know how anything works or I'm a grown up. Everybody expects me to know how everything works. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a mindset there that you're pointing out. And I think that in the workplace, we really are vulnerable because uh, if we are perceived to not be capable, you know, that's that's going to have a big impact on us. We'll see somebody at a, the same job for 10 or 15 years being overpassed for you know, promotions or whatever based on the wrong things and so we get careful to make sure we we figure out what those right things are and then we're doing them instead of being effective at our work we're effective at trying to get the promotion we want and i'm not even sure i mean i haven't lived in that world that much but i've seen that sort of a thing i started many many years ago uh working someplace and about at the end of a few weeks i thought i I really i I don't like this i think i'm going to go i'll be my own boss and go start a business. There and, you uh, go. And I'll say, you know, maybe I'm revealing a little too much, but I thought I could be a much better boss than this. That didn't turn out to be true. I think I turned out to be just as lousy as a, of a boss as any of the bosses I would not have wanted to work for. So, yeah, none of this is easy, guys. <laughs> we have to pay attention to what's working and let's continually turn up the good. That, that's what I like to think. And that, and that is the trick. And it's really the awareness of the systems and rewards in place for our kids. The, uh, you know, the joy and the reward is in actually of the, is in doing the activity. There's no other reward or stimulus other than participating in, in, in the event or the game. For us, it's a little different with the, the systems of work that are put in place around us as we try to write code, deliver software. But same ideas apply, Woody, and I think you're right. We amplify the good as much as possible, and it uh, it can't help but improve uh, yeah. our environments yeah. and our and the way we interact with each other, and ultimately in the outcomes we create through our through our work. Yeah, so we can respect that part of human nature that we see in ourselves. So, you know, that's a, the thing is that that we should be paying attention to these parts of us. And we sometimes just let it slide because, because of the pressures of the, of the work we're doing. And maybe it reveals a little too much about us. Let's find a way to do that. Let's make an environment where we can all excel in our lives and in our work. And that might, that might take quite a bit, but let's figure that out. It reminds me of a tweet that uh, our, I think all of us, our, our good friend Tim Oniger, uh, sent out today. He was questioning something he had overheard, where someone at a work site or at a at a, at a at a job at some point in his career had said, "I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to get my work done." It runs completely counter to an agile mindset. Just another another one of those systems in place that rewards that mindset that uh, really works against amplifying the good. Also, it ensures that you don't make friends <laughs> by saying that. <laughs> It does make sure that you do not make friends. You are correct. Yeah, I was talking to someone at the uh, conference tonight who was talking about a situation where there was a the the lead uh, technical lead on a team was sort of dominating the entire team, and then they had to go back uh, uh, home for a vacation or whatever. And while they, they were gone, the team was highly effective, and so. Um, a lot was done during that time, and they worked hard to kind of be able to keep it going after this person got back because they were free from the, you know, the kind of the direction of somebody who was well respected for his capabilities, but not well, you know, cap- capable of handling uh, this situation at work. So, 
yeah, we, we have to figure this out so we don't need to, it doesn't need to be revealed when we're the one that happens to be gone, everything goes much better. Let's, well, let's and I think we, I think we've done a lot of work in the area of efficiency and productivity and, and in the way people do work. I think the next step and perhaps the, the next uh, the next big thing could be really looking at the human systems in place and really putting a lot of a focus on that. I know it's a it's a very popular topic in our circles. If you go to any Agile Coach Camp or any open space, there's always sessions and discussions about how people interact and the models that we can use to to relate to and to work with others. But to the wider, more general IT audience and even organizational and leadership audience. That's really not front and center yet, but I think this will be the new space where organizations will be able to find, you know, the advantage if they're really able to understand uh, this space. Yeah, that's a real good point. And this is so. Th there's a focus in the agile world towards what you might consider the human side of work, human side of business. But that's that's the roots of agile. The whole point was. Uh, these these systems that were in place that were ignoring humanity or the human side of things uh, weren't really working that well. It's it, so I'd share this. This is the way I kind of thinking about it right now. If we if we have a system that we've designed and we try to fit people into that system, we're we're probably bound to fail with that. If we consider humans and their abilities and their nature, and we find a simple model of making that work well, that can grow into a good thing. So rather than just inventing a system and saying people have to do this, we observe what's working well and we bring more of that out just by encouraging that in ourselves. It's kind of like the idea of turning up the good again. It's like we, we can't invent that good system. We need to give chances for it to emerge. I hope I made that clear. Yeah, yeah, you definitely did. That it's a it's an emerging uh, type of thing rather than a manufactured, and that that idea is difficult for some. It's one that um, you know there are there's a lot of a lot of thinking and a lot of um, a lot of baggage in our industry that tells us that the right process is out there and all you have to do is put it in place, rather than observing, like you said, Woody, the good. And pulling those pieces out and, you know, turning them up to 11. And it, uh, maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe it's a, maybe there needs to be some really serious study and work and some data uh, and studies around it. But um, I think slowly but surely progress is being made. What it sounds like to me, and I'm totally on board with this, is that uh, if we're concerned with the, let's say there's a, there's a, a line that represents the work that we're doing. Cumulative and the area under the curve represents the total amount of, of good that we got done. Then if we're concerned with increasing the area of the good that we got done, then we should be concerned with the slope of that line. And uh, in other words, you know, there's the, there's the distance covered and there's the derivative. Um, I may be having my math backwards. It could be the integral that I'm worried about if it's the area. But the, the slope is the thing that we want to increase if we want to get the area to be bigger over the long term. And I saw a tweet recently from, I think it was Elizabeth Hendrickson, that was talking about something related, which is that if you want a team to go fast, then it's not a feeling of urgency that helps them go fast. It's a feeling of momentum that helps them go fast. And that rang to me as the same idea. It's not, uh, you know, how hard are we pushing ourselves? It's what's the slope of our line? Is oh, that that's a, that's a really good point. I like that. I like that. It's a nice way to think about it. That it's so. Th I, I, this conversation was happening. Uh, the the thing about the urgency, um, several times today. Uh, this uh, the idea that if we put upon us a false sense of urgency, we're probably destroying our chances of getting the results we want. But boy, it feels like that's what we need to do. You know, false deadlines uh, and things like that. Deadlines are fine if they're real. But false deadlines just doesn't make sense, where we feel that if we put some pressure on the team, they'll get things done quicker and better. Now, there was a study you guys will know where it came from, I'm sure. Uh, tell me if you remember this one. Uh, probably was from one of the, the current books like uh, Thinking Fast and Slow or one of those. But here's the basic thing. The experiment's being done where uh, uh, the 
the uh, person under study is going to be given a number to remember. They have to walk down the hall and repeat that number to someone else. Do you know the study I'm talking about? Uh, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and share it. Um, so in so doing, they, they're given this number. They walk down the hall, and getting down to the other room, there's somebody there with a, with a treat cart. And they say, some of the effect of, we're so glad you are participating. Uh, as a reward, we'd like to give you a little refreshment. Please pick one of the treats and then go on and finish the study. And so what they found was people that were given seven, this is how I remember it anyways, seven-digit numbers to remember, would generally pick a not healthy treat. And the people who were given a two-digit number to repeat, uh, remember and repeat, they would pick, they were more leaning towards picking a healthy treat. This very small amount of extra pressure led to making a bad decision. And there were enough people involved in the study, I guess, to come up with numbers that showed this uh, happening. Well, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know about these things. But that really kind of plays out in my own life. I think whenever we feel we're under pressure to get something done, we like to think we can rise to that. But in reality, we're making worse decisions. I I've looked, worked at places where they constantly expected people to work late because they were under a deadline. And uh, there's that old saying, you know, uh, that that after 5 p.m., we're simply riding tomorrow's bugs. <laughs> so, you know, this is what it is. We make the bad decisions because we want to just get this thing done and get home. I promised my kid we'd take him to the movies or whatever, and now I can't do it. And I feel bad about myself, and I feel bad about my life. And uh, things are just getting not so good for me just for this sense of urgency. I That's do remember that study. About, but you know that study. Okay. Yeah, we could probably look it up where it came from and... And it was about decision fatigue. It's about that there's there's some kind of uh, some energy requirement and some cognitive load of having to make a decision and carry information in your head. And that to me is is such a key point about software development that I think even those of us who practice probably underestimate the number of decisions we're making all the time when we're developing. I would I would guess not because I've been able to count them, but because I, specifically because I probably can't count them, that the number of decisions we make in a day is more like the thousands than it is dozens or hundreds. And many of those we're, we're making so implicitly based on patterns we've followed before. This kind of ties back to mob programming in that many of the decisions we make uh, are made more explicitly because we have to make them together. Whereas when we work alone or in pairs, we might make more of them implicitly. Okay, but the, exactly. the point I'm getting at is that in a day, we make probably thousands of choices, some of which we don't even think about that we're making. And all of that is fatigue, which is why I, I like that aphorism about after 5 p.m. or writing tomorrow's bugs. If we're not careful about how we expend our decision-making energy before 5 p.m., we might be writing bugs already. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons. Well, you've brought up several things there. That's one of the reasons I really like uh, working with the test-driven development because it did free up a lot of the, the pressure or the decision-making that has to be made. You come up, you make a very simple decision about what's the next reasonable thing to test, and then you can make a very simple decision about how to fulfill that. When you go into the refactor cycle, we have a nice, clean little a model to follow. If I see any of the kinds of code smells, uh, like the building uh, if blocks or long methods or whatever, bad names, you know, we do it in small steps and it leads us to a decoupled, nicely cohesive um, modules. That's a good thing. But a bigger thing maybe is the idea of how this ties into mob programming. That, that the decisions that we are making are shared with a group of other bright people so we have a lot more confidence that, A, the decision we're making is good, and B, that if it isn't, tomorrow we can undo it without shame. We can just say, oh, wait, look, this isn't working, and we invested a very small amount to find that out. And that's a powerful thing. I like working in a group for that. So both TDD and working with a pair or a group makes that load uh, very bearable. Throughout the Those, day, yeah. you share that load. Those resonate strongly for me, too. Thank you. So you know what I would like to see as an experiment where we actually can determine this? And I don't know what that, how that experiment would work, but I do believe even with an, uh, a beginning team uh, with some simple instructions, we probably could find 
what that load is, you know, just like that other experiment we just shared, how would a researcher find a way to, to learn something from this? But I think it could be done, you know, a, a simple thing to do. I've seen this over and over with some of the exercises uh, that I do in my, uh, in my uh, workshop on the mob programming that very simple constraints combine to make a very difficult work. The, the problem is, is that as soon as we add a simple constraint to something that already has a simple constraint, it's a way bigger impact than those two things separately might have. And as that grows, uh, it's like an average project where somebody will say something to the effect of, uh, so let's say a product person comes in and says, say, before we deliver this to, uh, to the customer, I have this one other little thing I'd like to get in. And it just feels like you want to you wanna comply with that and say, yeah, let, we can get that done. And then all of a sudden, you find there's five or six dependencies across the things that you just worked on. It's not a simple thing. It's a much bigger thing than that simple thing because of those dependencies. So it's interesting as we, we talk through cognitive load and all these decisions we make and how too many decisions can lead to to bad decisions, it's interesting to loop back to mob programming just for a moment and think through how that approach eliminates a lot of the risk that we're talking about. How by working together through these decisions and and really almost clustering uh, all of that cognitive load across multiple people, uh, we seem to save ourselves from uh, bad situations. Yeah, you're bringing up something I think that is related also to a couple other things that happen when we're mob programming. We basically have a one-piece flow. So we're not, it's not five people thinking about things that all have to somehow come together separately. It's five people thinking about a single thing. So we come to a, a workable uh, result really quickly so it can be proven in use that same day if your model of business allows for that. So it's kind of like there's three or four things happening here. We're sharing the decision making. We're reviewing the ideas before they turn into code. We're reviewing the code as we write it. And since we have tests in place, that's sort of required in the way that I work. If we have tests in place, we're doing it in tiny steps that are comfortable. And at the end of the day, we're not going home tired. Uh, we, for one thing, we try to, you know, at Hunter, we would always try to leave right at five. Uh, but we're not worn out from the day of work. You know, what we are is energized from having successes all day long. Matter of fact, I think that's a, probably a powerful thing that could be uh, investigated as well. What is the effect of having good uh, success at work all day long compared to uh, feeling like you're barely getting anything done or, you know, that you're working on trouble that you're not delivering all day long? I don't I know. I bet Just that's ideas. like compound interest, like the the graphic we've seen where uh, if you improve by 1% a day, then at the end of a year, that's so much bigger. And if you don't improve by 1%, it's that. Uh, but I would also conjecture that uh, besides the happiness and productivity there, that comes out of the, the successes and the reinforcement that you get from the behaviors that are clearly adaptive, uh, the the decisions that don't go well are not mainly the ones that you know, they are made explicitly and then, you know, turned out not to be the best ones. It's the decisions that are made implicitly that nobody realized they were making and didn't think about carefully or didn't discuss with the group. And mobbing generally, especially for the important decisions, that never happens. There's no way for that to happen. And so oh, those are the things that really bit. bite you in the butt. Like when, when you didn't even realize you made a choice and that, that led you down a path and now that's where everybody is. In a mob, that comes up. You've got to figure out what it is together before you go. Yeah, there's almost always somebody, e even with the, the kind of thing that will happen when you're working alone is uh, you're, you're actually switching context constantly. And I think that's why we feel we need to be in the flow or have this very strict, um, uh, non-interrupted work periods when we're working alone. Because we're actually shifting between the, 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 the problem space or the, the, whatever it is we're working on, the domain the, the design of the architecture, the design of the application itself, the kinds of libraries we have available, the nature of the coding language we're working in, all the way down to the actual code constructs we're using, and so on. We're switching between those as we work. Whereas when you're working with a group, we can think at the higher level at the group, at, with the group, 
Well, the programmer only needs to focus on translating the latest idea into code. Uh, everybody else is guiding us on the architectural level, and we're doing it in such a manner that we're not context switching throughout it because we're doing TDD. Mm -hmm. These things all work together. If you remember the original Extreme Programming book, I think, had the basic idea that here's a bunch of practices that work well together. And uh, so that's part of this, I think, with mob programming. Yeah, you know, uh, Joshua Karieski, uh talks about this um, concept of safety in, in our work. And he shares the story from Paul O'Neill about uh, safety at Alcoa. You guys are familiar with that, I'm sure. And uh, the, the thing is that, uh, that he shares these three questions that, that Paul O'Neill says that, that we should be able to answer for ourselves positively every day. And I'd like to share those if you think that's appropriate here. Um, yeah, it'd be great. So, I mean, this is a, when I heard, first heard Joshua speaking about this, it just really hit home with me. You know, Joshua puts it well, and also he's gathered just the right thinking here. So these are the three questions. First is, am I treated every day with dignity, dignity and respect by everyone I encounter, regardless of my race, religion, rank, etc.? So that's just about human interaction there. The second one is, am I given the things that I need? the training, the education, the tools, the support, so I can make a contribution that makes meaning to my life. That's about alignment and a lot of other stuff. The third one is, every day I can say that someone I care about and respect noticed I did it. Regular, meaningful, sincere recognition. This is really a powerful little set of ideas. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here. It all kind of comes together if, we're, if we have an environment where we can excel in our lives, then we'll excel in our work. And everybody will benefit from that. Yeah, I, I think those are wonderful questions and probably a great place for us to, to end on tonight as the listener thinks through those questions and, and how they impact uh, the work that they do. So yeah, what do you think for sharing those? Amitai, let's start with you. Uh, so we talked about mobbing, and for that I would uh, put forth uh, episode 32 of Agile in Three Minutes, which defines uh, my understanding of mob programming in three minutes. And uh, we also talked about uh, being kids and being grown-ups and the difference in mindset. And I have a blog post I wrote uh, last year that ties those together along with software coaching. And it's called How to Develop Humans. And so we can put a link to that post in the show notes. Uh, just as a, a fun, if you're interested in looking at a very goofy book that is a terrible way to learn about Java programming, but very funny. It's called Mr. Bunny's Big Cup O Java by Carlton Egremont III. <laughs> and it is completely ridiculous and a very good time, if that's your sort of thing. Very good. How about you, Woody? Um, you know, I, as far as sharing a book, I'd like to share... David Bernstein, and he wrote this book uh, over the last year or so, and it, when he he shared with me lots of it as we went as he went along writing it, and I just got anxious because I really wanted to get it. So when it came out, I got a copy immediately. He was going to send me a free copy, but I overnight I got it as quick as I could. Uh, it's called Beyond Legacy Code: Nine Practices to Extend the Life and Value of Your Software. So I recommend it really highly. It's, just, it's a joy for me to read because it covers all the things I'd put in a book if I knew how to write. And I just really love it. So uh, I'm sharing a book there. And then uh, I'll plug for myself. I'm really looking uh, for opportunities to do my mob programming workshop anywhere I can. Uh, it requires that uh, you know, I make it financially work out for me, but I've got lots of ideas on how to do that. Just finished my little tour to Boston. I'm headed out to Sweden in a day or two to do a similar thing there. And I'm, I'm just loving doing it, and I want opportunities to do it. So if somebody out there thinks they want to uh, help get me into their part of the world, uh, I'd sure love a chance to do that. For my part, this week I've been uh, in book mode. So I, I've got uh, a couple books here that I really enjoyed that uh, also get highly recommended uh, from me. Uh, Agile Impressions by Gerald Weinberg, or better known as Jerry Weinberg. 
uh, really interesting book that Jerry's put together. It's a, a lot of it's based on some blog posts that he's done through the years about uh, agile and agility. He did something interesting here with the principles and explained some of the anti-patterns of some of the, the principles in the Agile Manifesto. Really fascinating reading and uh, especially about how the misapplication of a principle uh, leads to some pretty bad anti-patterns. So really enjoyed Jerry's work, uh, Agile Impressions. Also got a chance to read through uh, Patterns of Agile Journeys by George Dinwiddie, uh, Susan DeFabio, Olaf Neeson, uh, Rich Valdi, and Dan Newman. A really interesting look at some common uh, practices and patterns when organizations decide to go down an agile transformation or an agile journey. Uh, really enjoyed it. Relates uh, to a lot of my experience, so or really validated some of my experience as well. Uh, interesting look at how things can go right and wrong as you go down this journey and, and some of the practices that help you stay on, on the right path. So that's Patterns of Agile Journeys uh, by George Dinwiddie and a few other co-authors. I also want to promote some local conferences. Uh, this year, uh, Agile Indie is coming up. It's on Tuesday, April 12th in Indianapolis, Indiana. Agile Indie is a great uh, conference put on by the uh, Agile Indie Users Group. Really fun conference, treat speakers very well, uh, really great environment, uh, and just a ton of fun to attend. So April 12th is when that's going to be, and I'll get a link to the show notes on how to register. Uh, we will be there, uh, Amitai and I, podcasting from the event, and uh, that should be a lot of fun as well. So if you can make it, uh, you could have a shot at being on the show. So we'd uh, love to hear from you and see everyone there. The other, uh, the other conference coming up is Path to Agility. Uh, our friends in Columbus, Ohio, I have organized Path to Agility this year. It is on May 25th and 26th of this year. Another great conference. Uh, the the organizers do a wonderful job. Speak or they treat speakers incredibly well. Um, it was just a wonderful experience, and we'll be podcasting at that conference as well. So we'll be talking to the speakers, the organizers. And again, a chance to just meet uh, many of you out there if you're going to be at Path to Agility in Columbus, Ohio, this coming May. And we'll get uh, links to all of those in the show notes as well. That's going to do it for this episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley, thanking you uh, for being here, for participating, uh, for all of your wonderful comments, tweets, emails. Really appreciate the feedback. It helps us improve the show for you. And that's what we're all about. Incremental improvement and uh, these wonderful feedback loops. So thank you for being there and have a wonderful night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com. <laughs>